Hey everybody, in this video we're picking up on our conversation about the new Apostolic Reformation, or NAR for short. Uh, we've done stuff in prior episodes, talking about our doctrine and practices. In this video we're specifically going to be talking uh, about the, uh, the vocabulary, the language in which frames the new Apostolic Reformation. It's going to be a great episode. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Howdy, howdy, that pre-show chatter. It's uh, it's going to be a good it's show, guys. Getting active very, in there. Very exa- uh, excited uh, about uh, our show today. We're talking about the new Apostolic <laughs> Reformation. Like, Cole Perkins, you guys are wrong. Well, okay. Thanks, hey. Cole. I appreciate well, that. maybe he's talking to people I, it, in the chat. Cole was... He was there when I was in Louisiana. He invited me to come hey, speak in Louisiana. Okay. That's who Cole, Hi, Cole is. He's probably telling people in the comments... I, I assume... I assume he's talking to the people in the comments yeah, section. he wouldn't talk trash about you, right? I mean... So... Uh, as you can see, we do these shows live, which makes it extra fun. <laughs> so um, uh, a couple things we have coming up on Tuesday, tomorrow, we have Back to the Fathers. We have a 12-week uh, kind of series going, so we're in like week three or four here, uh, talking about dreams and visions throughout church history. Have you ever wondered, like, what, what did this look like? What did prophecy look like throughout church history? going to be really exciting. And then on Wednesday, Josh and I are going to be interviewing Dr. Sam Storms one of the favorites on the show so uh stay tuned for that hit that subscribe button hit that like button and if you're live in the chat guys chat it up throw your questions out yeah and just remember guys we're entirely crowdfunded so if you've watched other episodes of remnant radio or you maybe this is your first time and you've been blessed by this episode or other content we've produced if you want to help support the content all you have to do is go to the links of the description give on paypal or patreon uh, and there's tons of ways that you can give there paypal one-time gift patreon as low as five bucks a month but as much to, as however your heart leads you to give uh, you can do that i also want to let you guys know about a conference that we're doing called the pursuit conference this weekend we're leaving on sunday we drive down to houston and it's going to be monday tuesday wednesday it's specifically a pastor's conference teaching you how to equip your church in the gifts of the spirit the pursuit conference matt chandler sam storms jack deer is going to be there you need to go check out that on the website radio and remnant gonna radio be there we're going to be hosting i'll be prophesying on sunday night you'll be doing the prophecy bit and so will miller we'll be down there doing a roundtable discussion you and me uh with the team it's going to be really great so obviously we believe in the gifts of the spirit and we probably need to say that at the top of the show we're charismatics, but we're talking Whoa, about the NAR. But What's the up? question is, what's what a charismatic? This? Because it's uh, it's not a monolith, right? That's right? This is not just one stream here. And, uh, and and we really want to, as we're talking about the new apostolic reformation, you know, we were accused on Facebook of being heresy hunters today because, you know, we, we have been critical of the new apostolic reformation before. Uh, we, t- we tend, we're not actually heresy hunters. I mean, we're, we're pretty nice today. guys, actually. Uh, but we do have some criticisms toward the new apostolic reformation. And, um, and there are numerous streams within charismatics, right? And so uh, and so we want to help you identify this specific stream of the new apostolic reformation uh, because, uh, I don't know, so we find it a little bit dangerous. What, what are some things that are dangerous about the NAR? Um, man, I think the, the NAR ultimately has certain practices that uh, cause people to be displaced and hurt. Um, you know, I've got personal experiences with friends that have the, the, the NAR has a specific ecclesiological structure that often places one person at the top. They have specific visions and callings that the Lord has led them to uh, that the whole structure then kind of submits themselves to. Right. So you have um, First Timothy 5 elders yep. who are called to direct the affairs of the church, First Timothy 5.17. But then you have an apostle who gets to tell the elders what to do. Yeah. Well, I would even say, yeah. And then so some will say that that is not residential. So some of the people that are like NAR associated, um, there's NAR incorporated and there's an NAR associated, right? So you have the NAR associated where they'll be like, hey, I'm just the pastor of my local church and I look outside and then there's an apostolic voice that speaks into our life. And that's just basically an association of churches that are connected well with one guy that they aspire to and, and like his his theology and ministry. Now, there's another kind of NAR, I would say, incorporated, where you've got this guy who thinks himself, he fancies himself an apostle, and and then he says, everyone's going to submit to me, and usually that's like the senior pastor guy, and then that kind of trickles down. 
Yeah, and and we did an episode with Michael Miller on that where uh, he got, I think it's called Fired from Nar Church was the name of the episode, and, yeah. and he talks about that. So the senior pastor takes this role of ba basically being the, the apostolic leader, and hey, everything submits to the apostles' vision. And so we, we just think that it can violate the plurality of, of leadership that is that the New Testament binds us to. Um, and, and really, this touches on the, the issue of authority mm -hmm. and the New Apostolic Reformation's interpretation of Ephesians 2.20, where it speaks of Christ being the chief cornerstone, the church is like a temple, and then apostles and prophets are the foundation. And so they'll interpret that to mean that as though what Paul is saying is that apostles and prophets have authority upon the church, and that in each season in churches, that this wasn't a unique thing to church history, that, you know, uh, and, and I'll just give my interpretation of Ephesians 2.20 while we're at it, okay? Um, in Ephesians 2.20, when he, when he mentions these apostles and prophets, we can't interpret this in isolation. He'll go a few verses later in Ephesians 3.5, and he'll talk about how the apostles and prophets received revelation that Jews and Gentiles would both be part of what he calls in Ephesians 2, the new man, the body of Christ. And so, uh, whereas in Old Testament prophecy, there are lots of prophecies that Gentiles would become part of, you know, would kind of stream into Israel, but it was a very Israel-centric thing. Yeah. Well, in the New Testament, it's like, well, it's actually a Christ-centric uh, a Christ -centric thing. And Christ is the cornerstone, and Jews and Gentiles are actually partakers together of the promise. His point is that apostles and prophets received this revelation, and, and it was in that role that they were foundational. We do believe that there are apostles and prophets today, but jo Josh and I would both say that that foundational role of receiving revelation about Jews and Gentile inclusion in what we call church, that 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 foundational role does not continue in the sure. sense that apostles and prophets are giving us new teachings right. and new truths that we must submit ourselves to, and that is a common teaching in the New Apostolic Reformation. Right. Moses, there wasn't a prophet in the Old Testament like Moses. Moses was unique. And they said, hey, there's another guy who's going to come. He's going to be Jesus. He's going to be different, but he's going to be like Moses. All the other prophets, not like Moses. Do we believe there were unique 12 apostles? Absolutely we do. Do we believe there are other apostles today? Yep. The word missionary comes from the same Latin phrase of sent one that apostle does. We just think that missionaries and apostles are the same thing. So if you're out there and you're like, they believe in apostles? J just hear us saying, we believe in missionaries, guys who play in churches. We totally believe that's a gift and a grace that God gives people to do. Uh, but there's another area of the New Apostolic Reformation that is a little concerning to us, and it's these spiritual and mystical practices. Now, as we get into it today, you'll hear some of this, but I really believe that you can open yourself up to some very demonic stuff. We've done multiple videos on the Courts of Heaven from Robert Henderson. Go and watch uh, our Courts of Heaven and, videos. And those videos are so underwatched because it's shocking how... Uh, uh, how I don't know. Infected. I mean, they got a lot of views. No, I, I mean, I, f I feel like it should be some of our most popular stuff. And the reason being is because it's it's touching so much of the charismatic world, and it really needs to be shared around because it's one of those videos where uh, we addressed. I mean, these, these they're talking about like speaking to the dead, uh, angels. You know, if you're giving enough, that gives you kind of spiritual authority in heavenly places to do stuff. We'll talk about that here in a sec. But man, if you're if you're like literally just waiting to like speak to dead saints, like. I call that necromancy, and I think you're opening yourself up to demonic stuff. <laughs> Although we've had Anglicans on the show who... Well, that's... But see, even that, they would say that what we're doing is we're asking them to do something for us. We're not looking to speak and interact with them. They're not doing, like, Saul, Witch of Indoor, talk no, to Sam, no. kind of stuff. It's not like... It's, it's not like our Anglican brothers are like, ah! You know, like some kind of blood yes, okay. sacrifice or something ridiculous. <laughs> we that in a different category. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and, and then, if you haven't... Even though it's outdated, it was our New York uh, New Year's Eve uh, oh, yeah. marathon of eight hours. <laughs> New York. I could see how you got that confused. Yeah, New, New York, Year's Eve. New Year, whatever. Anyway, it was like eight hours long, but uh, but we did this review of prophecies from the previous year, and it was just a really, uh, it, it was really powerful and, uh, and I think important uh, because every year these apostles and prophets are releasing their prophetic words over the global church or the American church, whatever yeah. it is, and Every year they seem to be wrong. Yep. And they seem to mix in some prosperity gospel into their prophecies. And, you know, they're, all, they're, they're prophesying stadiums are going to be filled and like churches are empty because of COVID that year. And yeah. so, so we, we reviewed those. But the, but the thing is, and the reason I bring that up is because there was a lot of, 
within the new apostolic reformation like we're fully on board with prophecy like i yep. said i'm gonna be Love prophesying it. from a stage Huge. to lots of people next week like we're fully on board i train for prophecy uh i mean we're on board but we're not on board for loose canon prophecies that carry something like apostolic authority something that's like you know, in competition with the authority of the written word of God, we're not in favor of that. Agreed. And I think finally, uh, what we need to do before we get too much further, I we really should have done this the very first thing, is there are people who are watching right now, you've heard NAR being used in a kind of pejorative, all stupid charismatics. And that's like, ah, uh, everybody's NAR because they're charismatic. We don't, we're not using it in that way. Uh, and then there's another group that wants to say, uh, everyone's saying that the NAR are some kind of clandestine underground organization. They're like the Knights Templar. They're like this, this secretive group and, and all the leaders, none of them know that they're part of the NAR. It's like, no, no, no. NAR is a category that was created by C. Peter Wagner. It's not like a formal organization or, or church structure. He's saying that, Hey, I've noticed uh, that there are groups of people who cluster together that have certain beliefs and practices that are uniform. And then another group of people, uh, Doug and Holly, uh, put together, uh, they've been on our show talking about the New Apostolic Reformation. They put it in book form and in writing, talking about, hey, there's a group of people that have a certain set of beliefs and we're categorizing it as that. Now, the illustration I use frequently is like dispensationalism, right? If I talk to someone, I start explaining to them, you know, are you a dispensationalist? And they go, no, of course not. And they don't know what the word means. And you explain, well, do you have, do you believe that there's a future plan for Israel? And do you believe like these certain theological things? And they go, well, yeah, of course I do. And then you go, well, you're a dispensationalist, right? They just don't know what the category means. So it makes perfect sense that there could be people who are leading the new apostolic reformation who don't believe they're a part of it because they don't know that we're talking about categories, not formal structures. Absolutely. So and that's and, helpful. And this vocabulary words that we're about to run through is really going to help you identify, is my church part of the new apostolic reformation or not? Yep. And even if, if your church is part of the new apostolic reformation, it, and your leaders might not acknowledge that, but if it seems to be, we're not even saying necessarily you need to exodus from that church. Right. Because, and here's why, there's a range here. There's like a there's like a NAR scale. The one oh, to ten NAR nice. scale. How gnarly are they? How gnarly are they? Right? And and some people are NAR light and some are NAR heavy. And the NAR heavy is what we're particularly concerned about. Because and it yeah. really the like the big picture is it kind of all comes back to the to authority. A single person who has uh unprecedented authority over your soul that goes beyond what the New Testament says. An authority over elders who are to direct the affairs of the church, authority to deliver prophetic words that are binding on the consciences upon the global body of Christ, authority to teach new truths. I think that we as yeah. Christians should be able to agree that these all these things are dangerous, but not everyone's going to be all the way there. Some will, and then some will be uh, not not at all there, or or just barely there. So. Here are some of the catchwords. Let's run through these words, and then we'll talk about like: is are these theological shorthands uh, bad, evil? You know, can they be good? Uh, I mean, there's words like kingdom, prophetic, apostolic. Now, those words aren't exclusive to the NIR. Everyone uses them, uh, but uh, they definitely get doubled down on and used well, as adjectives in the NIR. Yeah, I think your thing with them is is can kingdom be an adjective? Right. Right. Like yeah. I mean, kingdom I, finance. Yeah. Kingdom. Yeah. Kingdom influence and apostolic authority and, and apostolic there's like prophetic. Right. OK. Yeah. So, again, the adjective form and doesn't matter. It, and what you'll find as we walk through this is that we'll probably we disagree. We, we might disagree on some of them. Yeah. And, and we're not saying that they're all necessarily bad. We would just, we're just saying that if you're in a NAR church, you're going to hear these words a lot. Can I just read through them fast? Yeah, kill them. And then we'll kind of review it. Okay. Um, you'll hear kingdom, prophetic, apostolic, probably in greater concentration than you would find in the New Testament, even though the, those principles are important in the New Testament. Okay. Alignment, shift, billion soul harvest, portal, realm, accelerate, activate, fresh anointing, assignment, atmosphere, awakening birthing breakthrough dominion double why did you laugh when i said birthing, <laughs> birthing. double portion <laughs> impartation uh mantle open heaven promotion shift soaking strategic spiritual warfare spiritual mapping transfer of wealth unlocking again we're not saying all of these words are bad but i i think my question that i would ask you is if all of these words sound super familiar to you but the word justification 
is something you can't define, you might be in a NAR church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and again, I think that we should really aim. I mean, I don't think there's any way to avoid some Christianese. We sure, all have it. Sure. But I think we should really aim to major in the vocabulary of the Bible. Yeah. So let me give two examples. Okay. These two examples will help us say that using words that aren't like, let's look at the word portal. Someone will hear that word and like, that's not a biblical word. Get that one out of here. And they're like real strong biblicist. And, and I would tend to conform with that idea. Like, Hey, we should use words that are in the Bible, but let's use some words that aren't in the Bible that would actually be helpful and shorthand for Christians to use like, uh, uh, penal substitutionary atonement or PSA right? Mm -hmm. the, the term PSA or the acronym PSA isn't in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, but those little, you know, quippy little shorthands are helpful to communicate a broad theological point into a very succinct moment. That's actually helpful to do. In, in other camps, they will use those in a bad way. You'll have a guy like, uh, I, I would say Boyd, but you know, Boyd or Pete Greg Enns Boyd, or like we've been doing episodes, maybe. speaking of which, we did an episode with Alyssa Childers and two hours of stuff with Dawson, specifically on Brian Zahn. That's going to be so good. Uh, but that's all comes out while we're in Houston. All that being said, they use the word Christiform hermeneutic to have a whole bunch of bad theology practice packaged into a very concise word. Right. So hermeneutic, the yep. way you interpret the Bible, Christiform, or sometimes they'll say cruciform, speaking of the cross. Or Jesus hermeneutic. But, yeah. But but really what they mean is like, hey, we read the Old Testament through the lens of Christ, uh, the incarnation through the lens of the cross. And, and so what they tend to do is, uh, and that, that sounds great. I mean, Jesus does that in Luke chapter 24, and he, he Jesus is preaching Jesus from G Genesis to Malachi. I would have loved to hear that sermon in Luke 24. Jesus is all throughout the Old Testament. But the way they use, and if that's what they meant by Christopher hermeneutic, just see Jesus in the Old Testament, that'd be one thing. I'm, I'm on board. Yeah. I, but I, what I, they tend don't. to mean is that, well, those uncomfortable parts of the Bible and, you know, whatever happened with the Canaanites and Read them allegorically. That, yeah, read them allegorically, or it, it just, uh, it, they say, well, that doesn't look like, you know, that doesn't look like God was behind that. You know, they kind of made that up, and that was kind of their cultural deal. And so, we, we know that God is like this. And so, they, they tend to, when you read their books, it sounds like they're anti-Old Testament. Yeah. So, w what we're going to do is we're going to say, what are the ways that we can, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting congested all of a sudden. It's, it's a demonic congestion. I need apostolic release Dude, you to need, get you delivered. You need portal out of there, bro. So um, when it comes to these words, how do we define? Because obviously categories can be used to make succinct theological points, such as Trinity and PSA. That can be good. And some can be used that are that are bad. They have bad theological meanings behind them. So how do, how do we discern some of these charismatic keywords, if you will, these NAR keywords that are just really, really, really used all the time in the NAR spaces? Are some of them bad? Are we kind of over overreacting to some of these it, words? Because I think we are. I think some people on there are like, can you believe they use the word shift? It's like, if you never use the word shift in a sermon, like, <laughs> hey guys, I really feel like, uh, man, like, the, the 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 political space is shifting right now. It's like, does that, are you going to label someone nar for using the word shift? <laughs> like, right? It just or seems atmosphere. excessive. There's another big. Yeah, you know, it's really common in our circles to talk about atmosphere you know the holy spirits and that come and fill this atmosphere or whatever uh you'll hear that a lot but is it wrong yeah. you know it's so got some packaged I, theology and so what we want to do yes we want to put the words out there we're going to walk through them and, and some of them we will have a problem with yeah uh, some of them we will but we also want to be careful on the other side and we don't want to be the heresy hunter we don't want to just be looking for problems and, right in the body of christ so i mean we got plenty of our own problems so we here. want to call balls and strikes that's, that's right kind of a thing we do that's, try, that's what we try to do so, okay, so walk us through some of the things we want to avoid. Okay, what do you want to talk first? You want to, I mean, so kingdom prophetic apostolic. That might surprise people because I know you're the one that made that note. Um, well, let, let's talk about like, okay, so again, we want to find out how these things okay, are bad. Okay, so back up before we get yeah, into yeah, the yeah. words. Does it, okay. does it create a, a grandiose distinction between us and them? So when the word apostle, apostle is used, now sometimes the, the way that I would use the word apostle would be the way I would use the word missionary. This person's going to be sent, they're going to go plant a church, they're going to do a new work, certainly they're going to teach doctrine, they're certainly going to establish people, they're going to raise up leaders, all that stuff is true. But oftentimes the way that the apostle is used is that they have a spiritual connection to God and a supernatural covering in that there are certain churches, and again this is documented, we're going to go through this in here in a second, but there are churches that when they sit underneath apostolic power, they have supernatural power in the heavenly places and in evangelism. It's right. like God, the mediator between God and ministry is 
it, apostolic it is, ministry. It, it is communicated in such a way that rather than the, the life and light of Christ, like Christ is our head and we receive the blessing from him, we actually receive the blessing from our apostolic head. That's right. So does... And it starts to get us... So it's the us and them thing, okay? Yeah. And, and you don't have to be charismatic to do this. I mean, there are lots of other people who do this too. But, but is the leader communicating in such a way that they are elevating themselves over and over and over again in their degree of authority. And does does the language that we're going through, does it fit that description? So that those are things we're going to be looking for. Does it elevate a person to be our mediator between God and man? That's going to be a big deal. Uh, does the language force you to blindly trust the leader, right? Uh, and, and then we'll kind of flow this into point three yeah, through uh, mysticism and, I, and, I wanna, and speculation. Yeah, okay. Because I was going to comment on so that. So both and. Uh, through mysticism and speculation. And Paul will talk about this in the book of of uh, Colossians where people are they're like talk constantly you know sure. talking about angels and inflated by visions and he says that they're detached from the head who is Christ and I believe in visions and I believe in supernatural encounters and I've had some uh, but people who are constantly talking about those things like it's like uh, like 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 uh, <laughs> they, they just say things uh, such as okay um, I had this vision of an angel and the angel told me that so-and-so was going to win this election and they go into great detail about the angel and you feel like you have to believe this word because they saw an angel. Well, and then next week they saw another angel and yeah. then the next week and they talk about it like it's casual. But when I read the Bible and people see angels, they're not just like chilling with them, you know, yeah. except maybe the ones that take on human form. But if some angels, uh, you know, appearing in glory, they're not just chit-chatting with them yeah and let's talk about like the the mysticism and speculation when we're talking about building christian doctrine and practice around something we want to use the scriptures we want to open up the bible we want to look at those scriptures a preacher will often use an illustration from their life they'll say this is what the bible says on this specific subject and and look at this story behind here that supports that idea a lot of times what will happen in this NAR space is they'll say, this is the spiritual practice of how to do this thing in the spiritual heavens, right? And then they'll say, this is my experience, right? It doesn't, it's not scripture. And then the experience, it kind of explains it all out. They actually have an experience that they're trying to make sense of. And then they run to a Bible verse to justify their experience. It's a very different use of scripture. Mm -hmm. So, so we're going to ask ourselves, does this lean heavily on personal experience and this kind of mysticism and speculation or is it really rooted in god's word are we really finding out how to do this because frankly jesus and the apostles and none of the patriarchs warfared over principalities over specific geographical regions with specific kind of prayers it never happened in the bible right okay just isn't. which is touching on our fourth question is the language used to disguise unbiblical uh, unbiblical practices. So you touched on one, which uh, which is called within the New Apostolic Reformation, strategic spiritual yeah. warfare. Now, what they're going to say is they're going to say, well, uh, Josh, you're wrong, because in Daniel chapter 10, there was the principality of uh, the prince of Persia, and there was the, uh, you know, the prince of Greece. And so just as you have these battles taking place on earth, you have the, the, the supernatural principality, demonic, they would call them, their language for it would be territorial spirits. And right. that is an accurate designation. Why not? Uh, but here's what we don't mm. see. We don't see Daniel in chapter 10 saying, I cast you down, Prince of Persia. I cast you down, right. Prince of Greece. No, you just see <clears> Daniel <throat> praying and fasting for 21 days. Because the Prince of Persia isn't omnipresent and he can't hear your prayers. Right. God can. Okay. So the strategic spiritual warfare, it, you know, in fact, this makes me think of a uh, somebody on our Facebook page. Whenever we posted that we were going to be doing this episode, he, uh, the comment said, I wrote it down. I bet you think spirit. I bet you think strategic spiritual warfare is dangerous. Ephesians, much like I've never read Ephesians, <laughs> and I didn't know about principalities and powers and rulers and authorities. I guys, I think the way that we spiritual warfare is we pray to God. God give us power and strength to suffer well and preach the gospel. And then we go out, we preach the gospel and we suffer well. Well, right. I mean, Ephesians chapter six, it's the armor of God. It's the, heart, right. the helmet of salvation. It's the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the <coughs> word of God, the spirit, uh, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, etc. It's all the way down, but you don't see Paul anywhere there in there saying, cast out territorial spirits this it's way never said and um and so we're on board for spiritual warfare it's a big part of the christian life in ephesians chapter six it's sort Amen. of the the culmination of paul's ethical exhortations that began in chapter four so we're all on board for spiritual warfare but in the nar strategic is added at the beginning and who doesn't like strategic who doesn't like strategic but strategic means you have to have an apostle 
who gets a revelation that you can't get, I can't get, you have to be an apostle to get the revelation, to understand which territorial spirit it is so that you can strategically address it. This will involve some spiritual mapping, another vocab term. And so our point is, is, is this language used to disguise unbiblical practices? Well, who doesn't want strategic spiritual warfare? It sounds like a good thing but we would actually have trouble with it because of the way they use it. And please, guys, consider, I mean, I've had conversations, and this is going to trigger everybody. I had a two-hour conversation over Zoom with Randy Clark, asking him about spiritual mapping and things like that. Now, he may say strategic spiritual warfare and mean something very different than Carlos Anacondia. And that's one of the things with this conversation that we're saying, We've got to figure out what these words mean, and we've got to have conversations with people and start fleshing out what this theolo these theological categories actually mean when we're having conversations. Absolutely. So even when you just heard Michael talk about strategic spiritual warfare, don't think that every time someone uses that phrase, they're talking about Robert Henderson's courts of heaven. They're, they're different people it's, that it's have different Narscale. schools of thought. It's it, the Narscale, It can bro. literally be anywhere on the pendulum. That's right. That's right. So let's start with, um, we talked a little bit about adjectives and using specific words as adjectives. Kingdom, finance, Kingdom prophetic kingdom, apostolic kingdom power how do we do that yeah i mean I, I don't really have a problem with using kingdom prophetic and apostolic as adjectives i hate it so much <laughs> i hate it so but is much is that a personal hatred is that just kind of you know you we all have preferences for how church should be done but like i mean is there actually is there a danger in this? So Let me I ask you that. I hung out, hung out, we hung out with Craig Keener. Remember that time that we hung out with Craig Keener cuz we're cool and we just get to hang out with guys like that. So we're hanging out with Craig Keener and i was like hey Answer me this question about apostolic ministry, because people and you just remember used that. It. Remember, you just used the word apostolic. Yeah, you apostolic just, ministry. You adjectivized. It. I did adjectivize it. So I said apostolic ministry. Some have said that we stole the word from Rome. We stole the Roman. There's a there's a soldier in Rome, and he was an apostle, and his job was to go and conquer a city state or a region, and to, and to transform the culture of that region with you know uh, with art and entertainment and literature and and culturize these people that they conquered. And Craig looked at me confused. Craig was like, I don't know where you heard that. That's nuts. That's not a thing. And Craig knows more about Bible background context than anyone. I mean, I have his background commentary. It's yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Craig Keener is like, like when you go on to the, 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 the logos and like you want to buy all of the, the, the packages on background history commentary, it's like his commentaries are the Mr. ones that background. come. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. he says, so he's hogwash. like, that's hogwash. That's ridiculous. That's no, that's not a thing. So I'm sitting there going, wow, that's, that's fascinating. But see, that's the word, the way the apostolic is being used. So it's like, if you're going to be an apostolic, but you're going to be apostolic in the marketplace your apostolic or your prophetic marketplace or apostolic marketplace. The idea is that you're going into the marketplace and then you're going to shift that culture. That's the way that they're talking <laughs> the about it. They're going to shift that atmosphere. Okay. Right. Okay. So we you can't, have a we can't joke about sometimes it. Sometimes use, but uh, you know, okay. So Jack Deere, he'll tell the story. He said, you know, one time uh, he, <laughs> <laughs> okay. He, he, said, gotta, he said, you know, I don't consider myself an apostle, but apparently someone else did because they sent me a letter in the mail and they, and the letter said, we don't know whether you consider yourself an apostle, but we do. And if you send this much money, you can join our apostolic network and so on. That would have been a terrible usage, right? Okay. Yes. Uh, to, to join the apostolic network for such amount of such and such amount of money. Okay. So I get it. It can be misused. It can be abused. But I would also say this, whether Jack is an apostle or not, um, whatever. I don't, I don't know. I don't care. But is he and has he throughout his history been apostolic? I think the argument could be made that he has been. You well, know, so we, we might need to look at has he planted churches and done some missionary work. We could have the debate, but it, at least in the sense of kind of having a sort of translocal voice, it, it's apostolic, perhaps. But see, translocal isn't what what it is to be an apostle. Right. So right, has right. Jack planted a couple okay. churches? Well, sure. Okay. The, the that might make him example. apostolic. Let's say he had. Yeah. Let's say he planted 10 churches. I would say, cool. Yeah, would, he would functioned. You, would you say he's would, would, the, would, would you the, have a problem with saying he's apostolic? No, not, okay. not there. And, and, I, and, and when it comes to those. So, so you don't hate the word entirely. No. It's just the way it's often used. The way that okay. it's often I'm used. So let's, let's use this quote. I think this will help, me, help you guys 
smell what I'm stepping in here. Uh, this is from Robert Henderson. He goes, I called together a total of 10 people that operate in the seer gift to help me discern what was, what was happening in the spirit realm. As we began to pray and submit ourselves to the Lord, the spirit realm opened up to the seers with me. Whatever dimension of jurisdiction an apostle carries, the seers and the prophetic gifts will begin to see into that dimension. Oh, so... This is why I don't like the word apostle and being used ad, as an adjective because it's like apostolic authority. I have special sauce energy that when you sit underneath my ministry, it actually supercharges your ministry. It's like you are a good fighter, well, but if you sit under this, me, you can go super saiyan. At this point, because there's there's literally no substance in that quote. Whatsoever. Um, but it, there is loads of jargon. Tons. And, and what that does, I mean, I just want you guys to notice this. And, and people will do this. It, make, it can... It's a way of making themselves sound more spiritual, maybe even scholarly to some people. Okay, but it's it's just a cloud of dust. It's it's nothing. It's a bunch of jargon that means nothing. So uh, we want you guys to pay attention to that. Yeah. So and, and this would be another point that that Robert Henderson makes a big effort to say, hey, if you're going to do evangelism in a given region and you haven't taken authority over the principalities of that region, you have to first get an apostle to sit over your church before you do spiritual warfare. And then you have to do that before you do evangelism, or else your evangelism will be effective. So it's not the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation. It's the gospel, the power of God unto salvation, when it's submitted to courtroom prayer that's submitted to some kind of apostolic authority. If you don't have an apostle over you when you're doing strategic spiritual warfare over this region, demonic attacks will come after you and your family. So you've got to make sure that you have the right you have the right kind of balance and the right kind of voices speaking. So again, when you say apostolic, is it being used in a way give a person, endow a person with certain specific powers that are extra biblical that make it absolutely essential for you to have them, right? for you to function well, in just, regular ministry. just think about like all the new stuff that he added that we have to do. Tons. I mean, there's enough in the in, in the scripture for me to try to obey. Yeah. For now, you'll be busy for the rest of your life trying to make disciples. I'm going to be jumping through all of these hoops. And we don't, we don't name people on this show unless we consider them truly dangerous. And we do find, in fact, we've even done shows about whether we name someone or not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Robert Henderson is worth naming. If you're reading his books, stop. I would encourage you to please stop reading his books. They're dangerous. Uh, even border on, again, we saw, talked about this in the Courts of Heaven episode. That that book was Gnostic to the core. All the way and, there. Uh, and so it was just 21st century Gnosticism. It, it's, a, it's a bad deal. So, um, hey, I think we'll pass over the word alignment. You uh, Another word was shift okay mm -hmm. now why why is that such a big deal the word shift or is I it a, is it a big deal okay so, so i mean shift it's it's, a, it's on your keyboard so here, the, <laughs> the question would be does the word is the word used in the bible and the, the, the answer is no it's not in the bible so is it being used in a biblical way i mean i think the long and short of it is that it can be uh, i think i think you can say hey you know our cult, our community has really shifted the way they view um uh, uh, view abortion or whatever like they 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 used to view it this way we've been uh you know we've been in the community i think uh there's churches that that tithe to their community they do city outreaches and they, they were this this community was hostile uh, to christianity yeah, or, and now it's like things have shifted and they they, they like us like i mean in, i don't get what's wrong in, with that in luke 10 when the disciples come back from their mission they've been preaching gospel casting out demons and jesus says i saw satan fall like lightning from heaven uh, which would be a fun one to jump into but it'd take about five minutes my point to really adequately explain it, but my, my point is the one that I really want to make. Eschatology squirrel. Did you guys see it? There it went. <laughs> Whoa, eschatology squirrel. There it is. Yeah. So, but my point is he is at least remarking. So I'm at least giving away some of my interpretation. He is at least remarking upon a, some kind of shift that's happened. Yeah. Right. So, um, so there could be a right usage of this, but the question is how does the NAR use it? I know we have in our notes here, another quote from Robert Anderson. Uh, this one says, I began to prophesy the portions of his destiny that I felt were in his book. So people have secret books. That, that are in heaven that you have to find and read. Yep. You have to find them and read through revelation, through sort of traveling to heaven and reading books that are apparently there. Um, I broke the spirit of depression and I told it to leave. I immediately felt things shift. And here's the thing. Can, can I just say, like, I think the book stuff and the courts of heaven stuff is wacky, but I would actually use that phrase. I actually brought this quote in here for the sake of saying, I'd probably talk like that. If I yeah. pray over someone, like we prayed over a lady who confessed like, hey, like I have suicidal thoughts. Like we prayed 
and literally you can feel a demonic power leave and the Holy Spirit come and it's like eh, a shift. felt a shift. A shift I mean I, I don't know that I would say that but I certainly am not going to say anyone who does say it is Dude. gnar that's wacky yeah that, that demon went straight into a portal to somewhere yeah, bro. else it shifted know? right into a different portal <laughs> okay so <laughs> ridiculous uh, i hear people talk a lot about the billion soul harvest yeah now this goes back to where you want to talk to us yeah about bob that? jones bob, bob jones gave jones, a prophecy and not the university no the kansas city prophet there's there are groups of bob jones there's bob jones ifb independent fundamentalist baptist world but there's a different bob jones that was a, came out of the kansas city prophets right um there in ihop now bob has got a couple of scandals on the, under his belt and people will say hey he was restored you know i don't want to debate that necessarily but he didn't end so well i mean towards the very end of his life we've got video footage of him teaching bethel how to travel to heaven which we've done videos on you can go back and watch uh, and in addition to that he has also we've got video footage of todd bentley explaining how he was trying to travel into the third heavens go into heaven and and you know do one of his spirit tr field trips and then uh the there's a spirit that was dressed in robes and it looked like a monk and he told this to bob jones and he's like oh that's the dalai lama spirit that's preventing you from getting into the third heaven he's hanging out in the second heaven you've got to empty your mind and speak in tongues so that you anyway so again mm. this guy did not end well um and and again may, maybe he was restored but his scandal was pretty excessive as well and, and as from what i know of people who were very close to him and around him they would say that guy had no business teaching the bible so i would just say again but some of those same people do seem to think he was truly restored many of those people I, would say he's truly restored i don't really want to speak to it and many of them say. would say that he had an authentic prophetic gift yeah and, and okay. that which makes it so neither here nor there but he was the source of the billion soul harvest and he used yeah. to prophesy way back in the day i mean i know it was a long time ago um 90s a long time ago long, long time ago pre-fall anyway but uh Anyway, a billion soul harvest, and uh, and I think it went with like stadiums all over the place being filled, which is interesting because that was a prophecy over 2020. That's right. Uh, and so, uh, and so there was going to be a billion soul harvest. So, um, what's wrong with a billion soul harvest? I would like to see that. I who wouldn't like to see that? And I think that if you have a specific eschatological view, that that actually makes sense for some of these people. Um, and I think many, I, I think that you'll find that a lot of these views and these phrases come from a specific reading of eschatology. Um, this one in particular, I'm not against. Who doesn't want to see a billion souls saved? But again, where's our source material coming from? Why do we believe that there's a billion soul harvest? Again, I'm looking at a guy who's got a track record of manipulating people. Uh, that scandal, I literally cannot say it. Like, I literally cannot tell you in a clean conscience, knowing that there are kids who watch this. There are the, some things that there are some bad, to be spoken some of. Yeah, really yeah. bad stuff that shouldn't be spoken of. Um, and then again, the way that it ended, not good, guys. Um, so I, I would just say should we believe that god is going to save the lost and if your eschatology specifically says there's going to be a mass uh, a, a mass soul winning thing that happens towards the end a mass revival man praise god uh, but but using again that specific phrase billion soul har harvest it ties that back into an incredible uh, unaccountable prophetic ministry that i don't think we should we should be endorsing uh, or, or should, should be promoting frankly by by referencing it what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. I, I just think that if your church is talking about a billion soul harvest all the time, it just means that they've been influenced by the NAR. It doesn't mean that there's a problem with praying for a billion soul harvest. I mean, sure. I just think it's a vocabulary phrase to be aware of. Um, but I don't I don't think talking about a billion soul harvest is particularly dangerous. I'm fine with it. And I would hope and pray for it, too. Uh, so but why? But again, that's that's the thing. It's like if if it's like, why a billion? Why not two billion? Well, Why not 12 yeah, billion? Massive, massive harvest. Okay, I, I pray big for, harvest. I, revival. I pray, for, I pray for revival. Again, that, that's my point would be, why would you trust that because prophetic word? Billion. <laughs> okay, Sorry. he did this Movies. with his finger. Yeah. Sorry, he, they didn't see it. Okay, <laughs> I, I did this. Yeah, okay. So, you keep bringing up the portal. We got to talk... We, we haven't really, what we haven't done is quoted the Passion Bible, the Passion Translation on the portal. If you've not seen our video with Mike Winger on the Passion Translation, please watch that video. You might have thought, hey, it's just kind of like another message Bible. What's the harm? And uh, there's harm. 
in the passion translation. So we did a whole video on that. It's really good. Uh, but how, and there's a NAR connection to passion translation. You want to speak into that? The NAR connection to the passion translation? Yeah. I mean, the connection is that Brian Simmons believes that God has spoken to him specifically in a kind of revelatory way to enhance the Bible in areas that it needed to be enhanced. Uh, in little. addition to that, he thinks that he's getting extra books and some other stuff that's pretty uh, extra books extra chapters um he, he's yeah, another kind of chapter wacky. to the book of john that's right and so uh anyway so, so he's backing up his translation with extra biblical revelation uh and just we just get real nervous about uh tampering with the bible more than nervous anyway but here is second corinthians twelve ten in the passion translation uh so i'm not defeated by my weakness but i'm delighted oh no i hate this one for when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution because of my love for Christ, I am made yet stronger, for my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. Another one, 2 Corinthians 12.10. Oh, it keeps going. It's, it's uh, a second verse, but that's an ESV for uh, people who aren't familiar with it. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, here's the same verse in the English Standard Version. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So the key is, Paul says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. But the Passion Translation says, for my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. So, uh, what's going on here? Well, again, um, this is trying to create a form of divine cosmology of how we access certain things. And I think this is one of the things that that bothers me with NAR is that it, it seems to speak of things in these kinds of overly simplistic terms. Um, how, how, when we speak of healing, it's God's will to heal everyone. Everyone gets healed on this side of heaven. There's no mystery. There's no sovereignty. It's just cut and dry plain. If you're going to do warfare over a specific region, you know, it's not like, Hey, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose it's part of God's divine plan that you get your butt kicked sometimes. Like, no, it's like, you've got to like do specific warfare and have apostolic structures. And, and, and this, there's kind of this universal energy that's built into things. Well, if you enter into weakness, there's this portal that will open up and you'll have access to this energy. And it's like, no, that's not the way that the universe works. In fact, it's, it's by God seeing that you are weak, that he is glorified and his power is displayed through your weakness. It's not that you somehow get this divine energy that works through the cosmos that you have access to. We, we've got to think in careful terms and explain what we mean carefully, because again, things like this, it create they create systems. If you put a quarter in, you crank the machine, you're always going to get this result out. Have enough faith, always get out of healing. Have enough this, always get out of that, right? And, and again, I think this, it, it feeds into that philosophy and theology in ways that I don't think is helpful. Yeah, it, I think it, it changes that verse's meaning uh, from being, hey, you know, when I'm weak, God's going to use it for his glory and, uh, and magnify his grace. It changes it from meaning that to if it's suddenly a portal, it is a supernatural boost from heaven that that sounds more like a turbo boost, like a it sounds more like an experience that you have. And I don't think that's what Paul is trying to communicate that I have a charismatic experience with God that supercharges my weakness and make, turns me into Samson. Right. So, right. Uh, so not helpful there. Can, yeah. can we, I want to do this, qu this question here by Daniel. Sure. He says question because we're talking about IHOP and we talked about, uh, our boy, uh, uh Bob Jones, which obviously sure. is our boy. Basically is IHOP NAR? Yeah. Is that the question? That literally is the question. Okay. Okay. What say you? Um, I think it's a no. Okay. I, I've i met Mike Bickle uh, a number of times, and I have a lot of respect for Mike Bickle. Me too. I have a lot of respect for what he's done with, uh, with the prayer room. Am I going to agree with Mike Bickle on everything? Certainly not. Um, but, uh, but does he fit that category? Does he have... Uh, one man at the top is it their spiritual authority and spiritual structures that have been built into the system that cause abuse that are extra biblical. I haven't seen those. I don't think they fit that description. I mean, may they I, have some I of this vocabulary who, who says that they suffered abuse oh, I do too. at IHOP, and uh, I I don't know. I can't really. I certainly would validate that that person well, had a bad experience. Yeah, me too. Is that due to church government? There is it due? I don't know what it was due to. But again, that's a different question because when I talk about spiritual abuse, I mean I'm talking about like are there spiritual practices? Everywhere. Yeah. everywhere right? But 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 are there spiritual practices like courts of heaven, like strategic 
warfare uh, is there is there ecclesiology set up specifically Michael does love the word realm he does but, but see, you again, enter the beauty realm but that's how's that, that for a pickle uh impression what sounded, are you guys saying let that us know in the a chat. lot like lou engel <laughs> it, honestly it sounded like you know uh uh Lord, I plead your blood over my sins and the sins of my nation. Dude, that is in so abortion good. and sin revival to America. <laughs> <laughs> it, hurts, it destroys my vocal cords. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dude, dude, you. So my long and short of it is no, I don't think they're nar. Are there things there that can be unhealthy? Again, Michael told a story of a friend of ours, a mutual friend. I trust her story and other stories that have like that. Um, I, I respect Mike Pickle. The long and short of it um i don't think his ecclesiology is set up that way um i don't think that they are practicing certain spiritual practices like defined theological categories that have divine cosmology and stuff whacked out i i think that they might use some of the vocabulary i think they may associate with people who definitely fit that description but i'm not willing to say and that's why it's so hard is the charismatic movement is really yeah I mean, there's, there could be some differences. My Literally. eschatology could not be more radically different than Mike Pickles, but, um, well, I guess it could be. But anyway, it's very different. Um, he has a very literalistic reading of, of Revelation compared to me. But um, anyway, I don't think he's gnar at all. Okay, so portals, okay. is it helpful? Let's do realm, because that's one that, like, that one's actually used in the Bible, like in average translations. The word realm is used in the Bible 13 times if you use the NASB. And that one has seems to have the... I was trying to be the most generous as I could. And the NASB is a decent translation. So you're saying there can be a place... There can be a place. ...using realm. It's okay? a biblical so word. So then the next question, and we're kind of... You can see we're kind of doing the same thing for every vocabulary word here. How does the NAR use the word? So, um, okay, here's an example. I know okay. Robert Henderson. People... Oh boy, Robert. So, Robert says, people normally think of this as depicting a satanic hierarchy structure. This is, however, a structure in the spirit realm. Okay, are we back? Great. Guys, I don't know what happened. I think Michael has chosen not to pay his internet bill here at the church. <laughs> and I think our microphones are crazy loud now. There's no way our microphones were that loud earlier. Anyway, um, guys, I, I apologize. Let us know in the chat. Eh, sorry um uh yeah i apologize it has been happening right around the same time every time in the show so i apologize that we lost some of you in that program but the long and short of it is we were talking about what are we talking about we're talking about the realm the realms the okay realm. so the word realm in daniel is actually used uh to specifically speak of like dominion and actually the words in the nasb often uses the word realm when you go through the the uh, the, the book of daniel and you'll see that he uses the word realm to speak about the specific authority, like the realm of the earth, the earth's realm, God speaking to Daniel, or, or the realm of this king, the king speaks of his realm, everyone in my realm will act and behave this specific way. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, use of the word. We would typically use a different word. Uh, we would use like the word, uh, not, not the word kingdom here. I have actually written in here. We would use the word, sorry, that the whole internet thing threw me off. Um, dominion. We would use the word like dominion, like the king's dominion, or is the king's, I guess the king's realm is the way that it's being used. So if I'm going to be generous to Henderson and some of these NAR guys, they're using realm in, in a technically correct sense. Is there a demonic realm? Well, if there's a demonic kingdom and that kingdom has authority over certain things, like it sure, works for the English language. It actually well, works in some so, sense. I'm just I'm not going to yeah, beat them up so for it. So on occasion, it, they might use it in the right way. Okay. So... But I want to give an example that would concern me a little bit. Okay, so here's Revelation 4.1 in the English oh, Standard no. Version. Did we lose it? No, it's just that quote. I hate okay. it. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I thought we lost the connection. Okay, after this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Okay, famous verse, Revelation 4.1. Uh, I'm going to read you the same verse in the Passion Translation. Suddenly, after I wrote down these messages, I saw a portal open into the heavenly realm. Okay. What I mean, so he exchanged door for portal, and then he exchanged heaven for heavenly realm. Now, could heaven be described as a heavenly realm? Okay, I mean, any place could be described as a realm, potentially. Not necessarily a problem there. But here's my problem with it. Um, a common translation of uh, the, the translation heavenly realm is commonly used in the scripture in a completely different way. And I think that this could cause confusion. Take, for instance, the book of uh, the book of Ephesians, where the Apostle Paul 
we're talking, he'll say in one breath, let's say Ephesians 1, 3, that where it says that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, mm -hmm. okay? So you have heavenly realms there uh, in a good sense, like the the that, uh, that that's where the Father has blessed us in Christ, okay? But then in Ephesians chapter 6, you have, and you quoted this earlier, um, that, uh, that we're engaging in a battle with principalities and powers and authorities of this dark world in the heavenly realms, is how some versions translate. And so, um, so heavenly realms, you have good powers and you have bad powers there. And, and most interpreters will understand heavenly realms or sometimes heavenly places in the book of Ephesians uh, to be sort of like the spiritual world. It's a, it's the realm where believers are both blessed and embattled. And so uh, it's kind of like if you put sort of a transparency over this room and it's like you could see, or I mean, that's a bad, it's a bad analogy, but you just could see the spiritual realm. Spiritual realm, okay? Heavenly places, heavenly realm. That, that's kind of all the same for Paul. My point is, Right here in Revelation 4, 1, where he, there's a vision of literal heaven, he turns it into what could be confused as a common uh, translation for heavenly places or heavenly realms. Yeah, and, and I think it's really important that we realize that there are different words. Like, again, we use the word missionary and apostle, right? Mm -hmm. The thing is that the English language preferences missionary. Because when I say missionary, you think of someone who goes and plants churches, when I say apostle, you think of someone who infallibly writes scripture and is one of the 12, right? So when I'm trying to talk about apostolic ministry, it would be probably preferable for us to talk about the work of missionaries mm -hmm. because it actually lends itself to clear communication. Yeah. Now, someone might argue, now you guys, don't you realize that the word portal in some random language somehow actually refers to doors yeah, but when you say portal here, everyone thinks Stargate. Everyone thinks, you know, some kind of Star Trek, Star Wars. You know, you say the word realm, people think of Gandalf, you know. Uh, I mean, there, there's these words have meaning, and they have meaning within the culture of the people who speak those languages and those words. So, so when we are using the word portal, I would just say, guys, talk about an open heaven. Talk, talk, talk about something that actually makes sense to the hearer. Because when, when, a, when a person hears, hey guys, we need to open up the portal to the glory realms to experience this like transcendent apostolic kingdom power right yeah. now. So things will shift the atmosphere, you know, that we can come right. into our manifest destiny. Dude, you're so the good person, at it, I know, I, I grew up in this whole community. <laughs> I, the, like the non-believer sitting there is like, I got to get out before they start serving Kool-Aid. Yeah, like that just sounds nuts. tongues there for a minute. No, I no, tried, no, to just, no, tried to just follow you. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and so I think we would just say, don't be taken in by big vocab words yeah. or strange vocab words, portal, realm, accelerate, activate, open heaven, like all of this stuff, like it doesn't make you more spiritual. And your talk of all these visions that you had when you were taken up through the portal into the open heaven and there was, and there was this angel, and there, it just don't be taken in by that. That doesn't mean that somebody has special spiritual authority to speak into your life. Okay, we, we're pretty Unless close. you use your phone like Matt does to get into the portal. You use your phone as a portal to the remnant radio realm, in which case it's perfectly <laughs> like, acceptable. Like Matt? Matt is in the comments. He just said he uses his phone as a portal to the remnant radio oh, realm. Oh, well, I was well, like, praise God. Well, praise God. That's the kind of <laughs> NAR stuff we can get behind. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, so we probably have time for like one more word. Okay. So uh, I'm going to read them one more time, and it'll refresh everyone's memory anyway, and you just tell me which one you want to focus on. Accelerate, oh activate, fresh anointing, assignment, atmosphere, awakening, birthing, breakthrough. <laughs> I don't know why I always say it like that when I read it. <laughs> birthing. Breakthrough. Spiritual dominion. placenta. <laughs> Like oh I my gosh. Sorry. Wow, I was so caught off guard by that. <laughs> How do I continue? Keep going. Dude. Is that in the... Sorry. No, no, it's not in the Passion Translation. Okay. Uh, dominion, double portion, impartation, kingdom as an adjective, mantle, open heaven, promotion. Where do you want to go, bro? Mm. You can't decide. I can't, man. What do you want to... What do you want to... Okay. Uh, we could talk activate. Okay, activate. activate spiritual gifts, right? Okay. That's a big deal. Activating your spiritual gifts. So, People don't like that one. So here is, um, so Holly Pivik, we had it on the show yep. uh, back in November a year ago, talking about the NAR. 
uh, wrote a whole book about it. Here is one of her quotes. She has concern about Activate, and I want to see if you agree with this, Josh. She says, uh, the NAR teaching on the activation of a gift has more in common with New Age teachings than with biblical Christianity. New Agers believe that everyone is born with supernatural powers that they can activate or awaken or unlock by engaging in various New Age practices. Okay, is Holly being too harsh here, uh, or do you agree with her? You seem to not like the word activate. I don't like, in the same way that I think I talked about earlier about the the coin machine that like there's a there's a universal principle that you can just act upon to get the result so like some will say hey here are the things that you do that, that will activate tongues or here are the things that you can do that will activate prophecy i don't like that um now if you mean hey i want to lay hands on you to impart to you some spiritual gift like paul says like i want to pray and then the lord will sovereignly do what the lord sovereignly does praise god i'm all about that now if you're talking about practicing spiritual gifts like hey we're gonna, we're gonna pray and we're gonna ask god to speak to us and and if god speaks to us and he sovereignly gave the gift of prophecy and then if he didn't he didn't right so we're also we're yielding ourselves to that that kind of metric that's what what i'm comfortable with when i hear activate again i hear a kind of universal mechanism in which we're going to we're going to do something too so that it spits out for us some spiritual gift. Hmm. That's when well, I don't like you it. You know, and in the context of that quote, I pulled it uh, from her book. In the context of that quote, she's actually criticizing the idea that uh, it comes on the tail end of her criticizing the idea that you can train for and that people can sure. practice prophecy. So she's if she's coming from that angle, I would disagree with her because I think why would we put prophecy in a special category of gifts? that you can't train for. Can you train people in teaching? Can you train them in evangelism? Nobody has a problem with that. But you can't train people to be pro prophets. They're either, they either hear from the Lord or they don't. But, and honestly, I, I think that violates Ephesians 4, 11. It also doesn't make a whole lot of sense of the schools of the prophets. Like, people are going to say, yeah, 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 but, but what were the schools of the prophets doing? Well, if someone was teaching them, well, maybe they had like this special curriculum from God. I didn't see that in scripture. Yeah, I, I think... Um, I don't get it. I, I, I think that we we can't put spiritual gifts, certain spiritual gifts into special categories that you cannot train for. You're automatically 100% perfect at it from the word go. And and I think, uh, and I'm I'm maybe assuming too much. I, did, I don't know that Holly is a cessationist, but she... Nah, uh, I don't know. Yeah. But she's uh, she doesn't think we're heretics. I know nah. that. Yeah. No. Nah. So. I, I think well, there's a lot of room for agreement on some of this stuff, and there's a lot of room for disagreement. You'll see us disagree with Holly and Doug. And each other. We did two hours where we disagreed with them. We disagreed with each other. Um, but we also had a lot of areas that we were able to agree on. And I think that's one of the reasons that Remnant Radio exists, is we want to have these kinds of intelligible conversations um, with people that we agree with, that we disagree with on these subjects. We Just so you guys know, we've had a conversation with Randy Clark about coming on and talking about the NAR because he has a very different perspective and we want to hear it. Uh, I've talked to him for like two hours on it. He was doing a really big research paper on it. Um, now, Randy right. would be a guy that, that I would find probably more disagreement with. I think you might find more similarity with. You guys had similar circles back in the day. Uh, I don't know. Is that my speaking for you there? Like uh, Jack used to roll with Randy for a minute, right? I mean, ish. Yeah, I mean, Jack has rolled with a lot of people, and I, I think that sometimes charismatics can be a, a little bit looser in their association sometimes, and it doesn't mean they agree with everybody. Yeah, I would associate with Randy Clark if that means having him on the show. And I have to, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, I'm not going to agree Randy is orthodox. Theologically. Yeah. For sure he's orthodox. For sure. Yeah. Okay, uh, but I, I think for our viewers, just maybe a takeaway here, and, and maybe we can get to that um now is it maybe you were you were listening to this and you were saying just like josh josh said i grew up in this that's why he can just roll it like you you speak that tongue yeah <laughs> uh if that's you we're not again we're not saying exodus from the church we're simply saying begin to walk on a little bit of discernment and begin to ask yourself the question of are they twisting the meaning of these scriptures are they giving me spiritual practices that are actually never prescribed in the Bible? Are they making me rely upon an apostle's authority to, to move and shake and do things in certain portals and realms that I can't do? And, and are they are they elevating themselves on a pedestal? Um, are, are they exerting, is there a single man exerting authority over my church? Which is honestly, that's not just NAR, that's all over the place. Um, it, these are the kinds of questions that you can begin to ask yourself and, uh, and if those things are true, then you're opening yourself up to harm. And we say, we would say, okay, that is, uh, 
that is a scenario where you probably should look for a different church. Uh, but I would also say there are some people who have put every charismatic church in the NAR category. It's not fair. And, and that's not fair. And, and even, as we said, there's there's a scale of NAR. Yeah. Okay. And so it's just not monolithic. And so we, we need to have some grace for each other. Uh, and I I consider people who are part of the NAR, even, even those who are deep NAR, to be brothers deep state nar <laughs> deep state nar yeah and to be and, brothers and sisters in christ okay i i would okay now robert henderson i would i would say he teaches heresy but i i i think that's maybe like 11 on the scale of 1 to 10 so anyway be careful walk in discernment but we do consider these our brothers and sisters so so i think yeah. that would be mine I, and i would when you talk about a scale right i i would say that i was on a 1 out of the 11 i don't think that my church is practicing all of these wacky uh, experiences or teachings or anything, but we did have the language, the, the speaking in novel language as a way to one, maybe sound spiritual, maybe just because of the culture of the people that were around us, they just adopted some of the language. They didn't have any of the practices and they thought the practices were weird. I would really encourage you that if you're hearing a lot of these words, just begin to have the conversation with your spouse, with your family, with the close people at your church going, what do these words mean when we're saying these things? Like they sound real lofty. They sound really important, but what do they mean? Go talk to your pastor. Ask him, what do you mean by this? Because you might yep. find that this is actually the, the gateway that will help. This is the portal into you discovering some discernment, right? And going, hey, maybe this is dangerous. Maybe you have a completely orthodox church that you should absolutely continue going to. They should absolutely sacrifice into and serve into. And you just have adopted some weird language. And then maybe encourage them to go, hey, Go watch this episode of Remnant Radio. I think that language is concerning to some folk, and it's not really helpful in, in building unity and building up the body of Christ. So I, I, anyway, that's what I would say. Those are my thoughts on it. This should be the, the way that you start that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Remnant Radio is entirely crowdfunded, so if you've been blessed by this episode and you want to give, do that in the links in the description. You can do it on PayPal or uh, you can do it on Patreon. So it's five bucks a month. We have a vote. Uh, what book we're going to do next? Is it a Watchman Nee book? Ooh. Is it a book, uh, uh, a German guy who was a part of the Hitler assassination? Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer uh, or mm. Watchman Nee. Tozer, Watchman Nee, or Bonhoeffer. Tozer. Three books that are mentioned. Very good. You can vote on them if you have on Patreon. And then you'll be part of that book club. And every week we'll go through a chapter of that or a couple of chapters of that and discuss it as a group. It's going to be a lot of fun. People love that. Kingdom of the Cults. Kingdom of the Cults was a lot of fun. It was a lot of really great stuff that we, we went through. This is very much more discipleship, less yeah. less like so discernment. This is, really this good is stuff. Josh leading you in a book study every Saturday. Yep. Right? So and that's part of a benefit of Patreon. Do it. All Blessings, right. guys. We'll see you next week. Uh, Hit next that week, subscribe button. Tomorrow, talking about visions and dreams from the Desert Fathers, how to discern them, how to know if they're from a devil, how to know if they're from God. Uh, those things actually were talked about in the first couple yeah. of and hundred when, years of the church. And Wednesday with Dr. Storms. Yeah. Who makes us call him Sam. A storm is a brewing. <laughs>